It's only 30 years of Alliance supporting the leagues, and we're not done yet. Only the leagues, only the Alliance leagues. Hello and welcome to the throw-in in association with Alliance with me, Sinead Kazan, Noel Will and Michael Roth this week. For this week's show, I'm joined by Dick Clerken and Dunica Boyle to look back on the talking points from the Men's National Football League. And later in the show, former Cork footballer and captain Angela Walsh will be with us to look back at the big games in the Women's Football League. OK, so lads, let's start with Crow Park on Saturday evening. A win for Mayo, obviously, 2-11 to 12 points. A third defeat in a row in the league for Dublin. Their bottom of Division 1 with no points. Uh, Dick Clerken, is it looking inevitable that Dublin will be playing Division 2 football next year or ca- can they salvage this league? Uh, certainly not inevitable, Sinead, but, you know, they're in, a, they're in a difficult spot now. Like, they'll probably be looking at, obviously, the Kildare game, the last game against Monaghan. Like, five points probably would keep you up this year. Looking, I was just looking at the fixtures last night, obviously, from a Monaghan point of view, you're trying to, to see where do you can get to five, six points. So Dublin will be looking at those games and they'll certainly be saying that we should be able to see Kildare, Donegal, Monaghan and then Tyrone. Like if Dublin can't have aspirations to win three of those four games, you know, they're in a, they're in a worse spot than they're letting on. So they'll be still confident that they'll be able to stave off relegation, but they're in a dogfight. There's no question about it. The pressure's on and they're in a, a place that they've never been, having to fight for survival. So how that impacts on their squad and performance um, remains, well, it wouldn't say remains to be seen. It's not looking good at the minute because they say they, they were in that going into the Mayo game, that sort of mindset, and it didn't get them a whole pile further in terms of performance and obviously not in the result. Uh, Donica, you were at Pro Park as well on Saturday night. Did you see anything that Dublin would have learned from those uh, defeats to Armagh and Kerry? Um. <laughs> I think I think what we saw was maybe a little bit more the same, and it's that sort of almost unrecognizable stuff of them making mistakes and you know really fundamental stuffs. And I think because they were so good for so long, and that they almost never made bad shot selections, they almost never turned over the ball. You never saw a hand pass or a kick pass go astray. And now you might see three or four of them in a ten minute period, and and you know it's 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 really striking because of where they've come from. So I think what we've seen is just continuing teething problems. I'm, I'm with Dick insofar as that, uh, yes, they're 100% in a dogfight and probably three of those fixtures at least are going to be teams who are, are, are fighting for their own survival. So they are going to be in a position where it's a gut check sort of moment for them. And they're probably going to be doing some of that at least with players who are, are relatively inexperienced. I think the, the, one of the interesting things about the, the Mayo team on, on Saturday night was it wasn't necessarily packed with front liners. I had a suspicion that they might go out and try and lay down a marker and say, right, well, we've got one over them last weekend. We're not going to, they're on the canvas. We're not going to let them up now. And Mayo put out a team. You'd know Paddy Durkin. Um, you had, uh, you know, you, you, front line characters like of Aidan O'Shea didn't start. You know, they, they went with a lot of the younger and emerging players that have been sort of around the thing for the last few years and they still came away with a win. So I thought that was a, an interesting one from Mayo. But in, in Dublin terms, um, yeah, they're, they're uh, 100% in the mire and they're making mistakes that are going to have to be fixed on the hoof. Seven days to your next game, not a whole pile of time to to address these things. I think down the line into the summer, they'll be fine. They still have loads of good players to come back into it. But right now, yeah, 100% in a dogfight that I don't think anyone foresaw uh, even allowing for the transition that was inevitable. Yeah, you mentioned the word transition there, uh, Donica. A lot of talk about transition, about Dublin, but like you look at the new players, as you mentioned there, that came in for me, the likes of Jack Carney, Aidan Orm, Paul Towie, you know, they're in transition, you could say as well, but there's not much talk about Mayo in transition. Yeah, I think to be fair, a lot of those fellas have been around the setup for a little while. I think when 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 James Horn came back in the second time, he did. I think everyone accepted it was at least a medium term thing he was looking at. It was the break up of that great team that went toe to toe with Dublin for so long, and the emergence of new players. I think like you know you 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 still have uh, like you still have Killian O'Connor come back in there, and the fact that they're winning and tipping along without those sort of central figures, I think is a really good thing for Mayo. Um, they're. Uh, they're normally in the situation that, you know, that the likes of Dublin and maybe Monaghan find themselves and Kildare and, you know, that maybe after three rounds they haven't started great, they need a couple of big wins in Castlebar or whatever to pull themselves out of Meyer. They're actually going the other way now. They're exposing those players to top-level action 
they're still picking up enough points and they're they're like really comfortable at the minute. So they're in a great, great position going into the last few rounds of the league. Dick, is this a Dublin team just playing without confidence now? Yeah, and listening to Donica talk about the mistakes that they're making, I watched that second half on Saturday night and and not to be unfair, but they were so poor. Like, I think, like it was like just really bang average stuff in terms of the forward play again, and and then the mistakes, the kick pass, and the intercepted and kick pass, and they were just time and time again that you just and these were from players that have all earned medals, all stars. So then you ask yourself, well, why are they doing that now? Because it's the same players that weren't doing them. Uh, four or five years ago and, 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 and I think you're right Shane. I think it is down to confidence and I think back to myself as a player when did you play your best football when you were confident in yourself and the team around you that you went out and you weren't second guessing your decisions on the field and Dublin didn't do that for the best part of 10 years there they just went out with that belief that we are better we have enough here and we're just going to get the job done and then what happens is that you execute your skills to a much higher level your kick passing is cleaner your shooting is cleaner because you're just people so there's obviously something now is is influencing their level of mistakes and weights. Like even they're shooting in the second half. My God, it was just it was really really average stuff. And I dare say of a Division Two standard. So that's where they're at. And you know they they have to pull themselves back out of that because now that's three games on the bounce that they've delivered that standard of football. So it's it's not up for us to say that you know they're going to get back to where they are. They have to go and show and deliver a higher level of, of football. Than, and there's enough players there. Like this business of transition and new starters, you go through their lineup. Those ten guys there that have all earned medals, loads of experience, arguably more than what Mayo had in terms of of, of miles on the on, on on the legs, and they were way off Mayo. So it's it's you can't just put it down to personnel because they have more than enough on the pitch to get the job done at the minute. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword at the minute, oh. Sinead, sorry. Like, you know, not o- when Dublin of old got the ball and you get made a mistake and you kicked the wide yourself or you turned over the ball to them, it was an inevitability that you weren't going to get the ball back until maybe they scored a point or they were going to make you chase it for three or four minutes. And I think, like, over the years, they had broken team spirits nearly, you know, that there, was just, there, was, there was no real belief that they could, could get the thing done. It's, it's kind of going the other way now that just, you're just, Mayo was seeing mistakes the other night. It only emboldened them, really. Um, and the other thing is too that Dublin have dished out so many beatings over the last 10 years to so many teams and inflicted so much pain that everyone feels like they owe them one you know even though they're only at the moment they're a shadow of that uh, that team that broke records in everyone's mind they're still that team that has to be taken down and they're a huge scalp for everyone so they're fighting on every front at the minute Dublin and, and that's that's one of the big ones everyone is just mad for a shot at them now yeah, and there's a critical difference as well, sorry, Sinead, is that they're chasing games at the minute, which they've never had to do. They're coming mm. you know, they're coming from behind in the second half of the final quarter. And that's a completely different dynamic to what they've been used to in that they've had that two, three, four, five point cushion and then they can set up. So they're basically now experiencing what every other team has had to play against Dublin for the last five years and their style of play it's just not unlocking them. You know, they're forcing kicks because they have to. They can't just work the arc when you're five points down. you got to go. you got to try and probe. you got to try and get balls in behind. you got to take shots on because the clock's running out. So it's, it's just gone full circle. So it, how does Desi Farrell go around fixing this? Because it sounds like it's systemic, that it's attitude, that it's structural. You know, they're away to Kildare and Newbridge next week. You know, how does he fix this? Can he fix this? I, I, I personally think that Put James McCarthy in the team, that yeah. br- brings things along an awful lot. Put Conor Callaghan in the team, and that gives you an awful lot of shape and structure. And he's going to take one and probably two fellas to mind him. And I think that will have a profound effect on how their people play them. I don't think there'll be many teams going one on one with Conor Callaghan. You could see the Mayo the other night that they were going like, Geez, we can play these fellas, not quite from the front, but you could see the defenders were willing to, willing to take a risk and try and win the ball out in front. I don't think you do that with the likes of O'Connor Callan put Cormac Costello back into the team. I, I do think they become a very different um, proposition very quickly with a couple of personnel changes. And then all of a sudden, those guys, the young guys who are, I suppose, learning their trade at the minute, they're coming in into a team that's maybe on the front foot instead of one that's sort of on its back fighting for its life. And I think that's a much easier place to develop um, than, than where they are at the moment. So I, 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 do, I do think that when they get the players back in, I think they will be... Uh, I, I think they'll be okay and just about now, but I think they'll be okay. Mm. 
Of course, we all have players to come back in as well, like Killian O'Connor. Hopefully, we'll see him as well mm. in the next few weeks. But what what else is James Horan doing? We mentioned the kind of newer personnel that they've got in their team. Um, what's new about this Mayo team that James Horan is doing from what you've seen from the previous few games, including Saturday night? Yeah, well, I, I, I was very impressed with them against Monaghan. I was, I was over Clonus the, two weeks ago. And as well, Monaghan should have probably should have won that game. Maybe I'm slightly biased, but Monaghan done enough in the first half, left a lot, left behind them at half time, had you know dominated plenty of possession. But definitely you could see tactically Mayo, and you could see it again on Saturday night, you know, pushing up really hard, you know, pushing up a really strong line, really suffocating teams in their own half. You know, Monaghan struggled to struggle to get out then in the second half. Um you know, good balance of their play, like they're well fit to kick the ball, work it through the hands. You know, they're, they're, they're developing a, a nice sort of structure to their play. Still possibly missing one or two real good ballers around the middle of the field. I think Matthew Ryan, again, is a wee bit wild, you know, and, and I think they probably would need a, a more stable, you know, eight and nine. That's a, a real When you say wild, what do you mean, Dick? Well, he, he's got, he, he, he at one minute he could barrel up the field, you know, Big three men and stick it in the net, and the next thing he he'll just turn over ball and he'll run down blind alleys, which which he done again on, on Saturday night. So, as I always say, you know if you're going to be a, a you know an All Ireland or a top tier eight or nine, you've got to be consistent. You've got to be a Brian Fenton. You've got to be somebody that you can rely on that can score, but 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 is is consistent. I think that they're, they're, that's that's one area of the field that cost them arguably in the All Ireland final last year that they got beaten in the middle of the field and that set the tone for everything. So. I think I like what they're doing at the defence. You know, Robbie Henley, you know, he's having the, the, the career, you know, he's, he's reborn. Um, I think up front, you know, they're, they're, they're getting a good spread of scorers. O'Donoghue is really developing into a, you know, a real marquee forward and and, and, and Dion O'Connor and, and his brother to come back in. I think if they want to go the next bit, it's, it's that, that that real solid, consistent eight or nine, which they still haven't found. Again, no shade coming in now as a, as, a, as a sort of an impact sub, doing a good job. Loftus, you know, was he ever really a midfielder? So that's that's to me the one area I'm looking at Mayo that they still want to do. OK, well, Mayo are home to Armagh next Sunday in Dublin, of course, are in Newbridge to play Kildare. Now we'll go to Clarny next and Kerry, 113, Donegal, seven points. Again, difficult conditions, as you will well know, Donegal. Are you warmed up yet from being down there? Just about. Broke, <laughs> broke, out, broke out the hot whiskey last night when I got in the door. It was... Uh... Awful day from start to finish. Now, in fairness, the, the surface in Killarney was it's a, it was exceptionally good considering the conditions and the amount of rain they'd taken. But insofar as analysing the game, it's, it's really difficult to know how much stock you can put in it because the most significant factor in the match was not the players or the referee or anything like that. It was the wind. Mm-hmm. And um, Donegal actually started quite well. There were two points, uh, two points each after 12 minutes, and that was them playing into a big gale. And after that, uh, Kerry took control. Uh, Sean O'Shea was exceptional and um, kicked seven points. It was 9-2 to Kerry at half time. But again, to repeat myself, the wind was so strong, you could still make the case that Donegal were in the game at that stage. Um, because they, you know, they, they you know, a 45-yard kick was a chip shot, really, uh, down to the Lewis Road ends on the day that was in it. But I think the single best thing for, for Kerry was the way they handled the wind in the second half. Didn't necessarily do it that well against Dublin when they had that lead at half time. I think the, the, yesterday they were brilliant at it. They outscored Donegal one four to maybe three or four points. They, they, they or five points, I think, um, in the second half, and, and that was the single best thing about Kerry. They managed that very well, and I suppose even more crucially, the one without having David Clifford on the pitch. Now he came on and got one one, but they probably would have won without him. In fact, I, I put my house on it that they would have seen it out without him. So. You know, just another little step in the line for development. And most importantly, Kerry, best re- defensive record in Division 1 and haven't conceded a goal. And, you know, how long have we been talking about Kerry, their defence, do they have the right personnel, are they playing the right system? Early days, but so far you'd have to say that they're doing really well in, in, in that regard. Yeah, Dick, that's right what Donica says. They have the best defensive record. Is that the main thing we're seeing so far about the Jack O'Connor early days with, with Kerry, his return to Kerry? Yeah, they're definitely tighter. Um, they know what they have up front, so they don't really have to work. You just have to keep them boys fit and keep them fed with with good primary possession. They, they, they don't need to be told what to do, so they need to tighten up the back. Um, you, you could make the argument that they've had, in terms of their fixtures, three nice fixtures. They're getting Dublin at home when they're on a downer, at Kildare and, and Donegal. So let's let's see. I, I wouldn't just say like the one 
test that they had against Kildare, that didn't really go too well for them. So there, I would say there's just a, a bit of an asterisk there for, for Kerry. Now, Donegal were really poor yesterday, Donegal, mm. you can see. Like, really, I dare say, a little bit clueless in terms of how they were trying to play. Like, they had a wind at their back and they were still kicking short kick out to guys. I was saying, when I mean, you have a wind at your back and you're chasing six points, you just get that ball on the D and have players up there and... He, Odds law, you'll get half of them, and then it's as you say, it's it's, it's, it's a score is almost a fair complete. But they were still messing around with hand pass and getting turned over, and, and Kerry could add another two or three goals. And uh, so Donegal without Michael Murphy are looking a very very average team at the minute. No point in saying otherwise. I was at the Monaghan Donegal McKenna Cup final but four weeks ago, and Murphy wasn't playing there in the first half, and Donegal were really poor. Monaghan were ten points up at half time, and they pulled it back a wee bit. So. There'll be there'll be concerns not just about the weather in Donegal at the minute, but where they're going with uh, with uh, without Michael Murphy and where that injury is at the minute because um, they'll be looking at where they're going to get points because they're they're in that relegation dogfight at the minute and you know I say the Donegal I don't know when the Donegal Dublin game falls but that'll be a critical team critical game for both. So are you saying, Dick, that uh, in Ishkeen this weekend, Monaghan against Kerry would be the real test to Kerry? Yeah, well, they've, they've, they've come there before and came out with nothing, and that'll be the that'll be the Bandy's play again. It was supposed to be in Clonus. Um so it got pulled down in the skiing. The skiing's a good surface now; it's just tighter ground, smaller capacity, and listen, it gives the carry carry lads less less to drive as well. So maybe we're thinking of them this time around. <laughs> nice you play that one, you know. Yeah. So come here, you were at the Gaelic grounds, Armagh won seven, Monaghan ten points. Uh, dare I ask, was a draw fair result, Dick? Yeah, it was, but I begrudgingly say that when we should have been close to 10 points up at half time, you know, that albeit with a breeze and I would have thought a contentious sending off and I suppose that I, obviously in real time you weren't too sure what happened but then on, on the footage, no, there was enough, there's enough went 10 minutes to go, Sinead, absolutely, that was our Maz game to win. You were saying, you know, we're at man down, they had got a bit of momentum and it was all with them and they failed to win it and, and it was a massive, Credit to the work rate, and I keep saying about the Monaghan boys. Like, it, like most teams, Dublin's carries were not winning that game. We're not getting anything out of that game. You know, there was the effort of some of the Monaghan guys to put in to scrape out a point. Um, and I mentioned Darren Hughes in a tweet. Like, you know, you talk about age and guys getting on. It's phenomenal the effort that he put in the turnovers, and and it took that effort because they were on the back foot and. Uh, Really good game, great atmosphere. Like there's ten thousand people are close to it. Um, so both sides would be happy to get something out of it, but no, they probably could have had two or equally none either. So yeah, to answer your original question, it's always fair. It should yeah, be a lot more comfortable, Dick. Shouldn't they really like you know going back to that uh, Tyrone game? You know they were they had that chance to to uh, to win it at the end with the free with Rory Bregan's free, and you know that that seemed like a chip shot for him because he's such distance, and you know that. Felt like a point dropped. Even the other night, you can make the case it was a point dropped. You know, it, it's they're lo- they could be looking up instead of looking down at the minute. Oh, like and 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 the Mayo game as well. Like they've done enough from that game to to win it. Now Mayo are the better team on balance, but and, and you know they're not taking a chance. That's Monaghan's problem at the minute. They're just not. They're not. They're not converting enough. You know, mm. Jack's just a wee bit off at the minute, even though we don't fierce well to to get the equalizer, or, you know, they're leaving a lot behind them now in terms of, of, of scoring chances. And, and they'll be looking at that because everyone sort of, it, it, it's the stand out issue. You know, they're, they're very solid to the back. Rory Began is, I would say, even a kind of, we'd say at club level around here, he's worth five points to Scotstown before a ball is kicked. His influence is such in terms of his kickouts, his scoring, and now his third dimension as a, as a, a sort of an outfield player and only for him coming out. In that last 10 minutes, acting as that extra man that they didn't have, they probably would have lost the game. So midfield, like Darren, as I say, Darren's reborn and, and they've got a good... So if they can get Jack Byron again, Connor back in, fit, um, Monaghan are a good place. But yes, they, they need to sort their, their attack out in front. They need, to, they need to get sharp in front of goals because everything else from their back is, is in pretty good shape. Speaking of a regret, maybe uh, Tyrone's uh, win over Kildare and Oma yesterday. Did Kildare deserve to get something out of this game, Donica? Um, I think on on the balance of what they've done so far in the league, yeah, yeah, I think so. I do think you're probably looking at a Tyrone team that are just starting to find their legs a little bit now. You know, they, everyone knows they came back a little bit late to had their holiday, um, but they did that. I think there was there was a seven of last year starters not in the All Ireland final starters not in the team. 
So, um, you know, and, and they still sort of dug their way out of it. And that's sort of, that's that's a great sign for Tyrone that they're starting to just motor at just the right time. And they came with a late gallop just to get over the line at the end. Like, I, th- I think Kildare have been here before, you know, they've been up in Division 1 before and they've put in some, even even me a couple of years ago, they put in some good patches and periods of performances but they were never stringing it all together to 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 get a point or get something out of it. And Kildare have that a couple of times now. You know, they did really well to get the draw against Kerry. Did were really competitive with the Ireland champions yesterday. And yet and all they're still they're still at the, at at the in a dog fight. So they're, they're in a tight spot. But I think if if they can find a way to dig themselves out of it and stay in Division One, I, I think it would stand to them. Another seven Division One matches next year. Kildare have a lot of good players and and crucially a lot of good forwards at the minute um, so if they can get them into enough high class games I think they could they could really develop but staying in Division 1 now is huge for them just for where they are at the minute Yeah, yeah Dick Dunnock mentioned it there Tyrone were without mm-hmm. seven um, All-Ireland final starters in the game at the weekend the fact that they still came through it what does that say about Tyrone? Yeah I'd say they were just delighted now coming out of Oma um, had a rocky enough start and yeah it's okay you only get We'll get away for so long saying you know holidays and you know a soft start like they were they had the two week break you know boys now don't lose too much fitness even on a, on a, on a holiday you know you look at them playing like they're carrying no weight so they, they they know that even with the four men down you know that they, they were due a performance and and they got it like and and, and as Dunnick said with the men out to get that as a massive you know um shot in the arm for them so that almost you can almost say that's thrown up and running for 2022, um, the three points on the board, and they'll be looking at their fixtures to sort of say, yeah, we'll get, we'll get enough here to to put the league to bed, and then can start looking at the championship. Kildare, yeah, they had enough chances; they could, could have got a few goals, but you have to balance that out. Donegal could have worked in a few goals as well on the other side, so you know they had their chances, they didn't take it, and you know they, they'll fight. And Kildare will pick up more points. Will they get enough just to stay out? You know, at did all come down to the last day, and I think we have to go to Newbridge. Monaghan have to go to Newbridge in the second last. You know, that'll again be a, you know, a four pointer really to see who could be, uh, you know, heading 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 down or staying up for the for the for the following year. Well, it's going to be a four pointer this weekend anyway. It would seem uh, Kildare playing uh, Dublin in Newbridge. I really yeah. feel like Kildare will have to bring all that Newbridge or nowhere kind of defiance. Day. How do you see this game going this weekend? Well, full house, and like hopefully. This weather sort of gives us a break and, and allows the crowds to travel and enjoy the game. There's not that much cover in in Newbridge, but yeah, so it's going to be a not to, not to the steal a term of calls and an atmosphere. And then, then, as you say, Sinead, they need to sort of try and pull in some of that, you know, motivation that they had that day against Mayo and, and try and get a get a guess a performance. And it's there, like they're really fit and strong, like as, as every team in Division One, like you, you don't compete. At Division One now, unless you're you're physically able, and they are up there, they just need to try a wee bit more efficient in front of goals and try and just like Mayo do and Kildare. It's just a bit of chaotic madness gets them over the line. You know, it's just complete high energy and bring that. And if they can, and and ask huge questions of the Dubs, like I put it to this: if Kildare go against Dublin, try and play play a cagey sort of ball or tension type game. You know, waste of time. They, they they can beat Dublin by just going at them and trying, you know, go at Dublin when they're weak and there to be beaten. But don't don't respect Dublin because with all due respect, Dublin didn't respect them for the last 10 years. They should be looking at this game, right? That's Dublin at home. When are we no, no nobody in here has ever beaten Dublin in terms of now's the time. This is Glenn Ray. This is his you know clarion call. If you want to ever beat Dublin, this could be your only time. You know, you've taken a licking from them for the last 10 years. You know, you have, you have the whole crowd behind you, you go out and do it and go at them. Do you know what I mean? You know, and I think they will. I think they'll give a real good account of themselves now, but Daddy Farr on the other side will know, right, the excuses are gone here. we we got to get something out of here or else, you know, they're in serious, serious bother and, and, and there's no talking around it. Yeah, no, it should be a cracker. And um, Donica, probably the, the story of the league as well has been London. I mean, an absolutely brilliant run in Division 4. Three wins from three. They beat Andy Moran's Leitrim um, on Sunday. The fact that they hadn't played a game in almost two years because of the pandemic. I mean, how have they brought this all together? I, I remember doing a piece with, with, with Michael Maher maybe with early last year and just talking about it. And he was like very upbeat. And I have to think like being cut off from the rest of the league, I would have thought that, you know, it set them back, you know, naturally just did no exposure to good games when everyone else was getting them. And that was the thing that nearly always affected London at the start of the year because everyone else was coming off a 
a few games in the Bourne Cup or whatever competition they're playing in pre-season. London were generally going in cold. And now they're going in cold this year after two years and nothing. And they've hit the ground running. Like it's, it's a great story. It's remarkable. It's a throwback to the year they got to the Connacht final and they sent a letter to the Queen inviting her to the... <laughs> To, to ask her, did she want to come to watch them? And, and there, as it turned did out, she got, well, she did she decline? She did, yeah. I actually remember seeing it from, oh, I don't know, did, I, somebody posted it anywhere online. Um, but she, uh, whoever her office was, they politely declined the, the invitation to Castle Bar or whatever the game was. So, um, but no, it's a brilliant story. And you have to say, like, you know, you, you might say the first weekend that maybe did they catch someone off guard or, and then they did it twice, you know, wow, and did it three times in a row against the Leitrim team, of, you know, of Andy Moore. And there's a lot of talk about them. So like they're they're they have to say they're right in the mix now three three from three it's a it's a it's a remarkable story and I hope now I just hope they can keep it going because um they're they're against the odds in every way so and everyone loves that sort of an underdog story so good luck to them yeah no, absolutely they might send her an invite for their game against Leitrim and Rice Slip in the kind of championship of course on the seventeenth of uh, April that will be a cracker <laughs> that's just to wrap up um in Division Two Dick um obviously goal against Offaly was postponed Derry on top had finished a draw between Mead and Down Down Cork and Mead all on one point obviously mm. Offaly didn't play at the weekend there are no points um obviously there's the ramifications for the Chelton Cup how is this division going to shake down do you think. Yeah, you, you listed off three counties there, sort of traditional counties that we thought were starting to move in the right direction, Cork, Meath and down, and, and looks like two of them, at least one of them are going to be heading back down into, into Division 3. So not much to be optimistic about in those three counties from what we've seen so far. Um, Derry, as I keep saying on, on this podcast over the last you know four or five weeks, Keeping an eye out on, on, on what they're doing, like very comprehensive again against Cork. You know, you, 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 Derry are now doing what they haven't done for the last, well, as long as I'm playing. They've got a cohesiveness, they've got all the best players in Derry playing. And, you know, you see what the talent that they have. They just, year on year, there's always been a couple of key players missing or, or issues behind the scenes with holding them back. So they're fit, they're, they're, they're playing at the top of the ground. And, you know, I think they've both struck the So, yeah, they're odds on to get promoted, I think, at this stage. So it's whoever yeah. else fall away, maybe it'll come from the pack off. You know, so there'll be a bit of a dog fight down at the bottom. Probably imagine maybe maybe you know, Galway will pop their heads up there to maybe snip, snip second place. But uh, yeah, Derry's the sort of the talking point. But again, very disappointing to see how how those other counties that you, you want you want to see your traditional counties up and fight, not just for the league, but come come the Monster Championship. You want a good Cork for Leinster Championship. You want a good Meath, and it's disappointing not to see that. To be honest with you. Mm. Donica, how do you think? How do you think? Yeah, of I, I, I covered I covered Mead was common last week, and um, Mead were poor. There's no two ways about it. They were just poor in pretty much every department, and that was against a Ross Common team who still hadn't brought back their mm. Pierce's players or their Folly's players. So looking at maybe five starters that were out, and and Ross Common, you'd have to say that they deserved it. Um, they're just, uh, you know, there, there is some mitigating circumstances from Mead's point of view. They're missing the fullback, Conor McGill, is very important. They're missing the first choice midfield pair, and they were very important. But, like, there's, there's, just not, uh, there's just not a whole lot of momentum or anything behind them at the minute. And, like, a draw kind of did nothing for either Mead or Down yesterday. Um, uh, and I do, I, I, it's kind of nearly, there's, two, there's nearly two mini divisions within Division 2. And I think at the bottom end is Cork, uh, Mead, I think Offaly will be in there and uh, down. And uh, it's, it's two, two of those four to go down for me. Um, and, and in terms of Talchon Cup, so obviously they're still the out of getting the provincial final. That looks next to impossible for down, I would say. I think they have Monaghan first of the dick. Uh, down yeah. Monaghan. Down Monaghan. And if, let's say, they manage to come through that, they could potentially play in All-Ireland Champions Tyrone. So the route to the provincial final is, is very difficult for them. Yeah. Mead, we don't really know because they'd have to win their first game and then we don't know what the semi-final draw is. And Cork have Kerry in the Munster semi-final. So, you know, it's unlikely they'd get to, uh, uh, you'd have to say at this stage, get to a, a Munster final. So, like, they are in a real scrap already, all of them. And I think it's going to come down to the games between those four teams. I think, like, whoever can win against the teams around you, if you can see it beat, up, beat an Offaly or beat a down or beat a Mead, whatever is on your fixture list, I think you'll be okay. But... Um, there's serious ramifications for all four of those teams. Yeah, yeah, yeah huge. And, and I think I know you need to. Go, and having been there at times when we were playing, like sometimes, like the standard in Division Two, when you're there, is very even, and there's very little separates the teams. Mm. And, and usually, mitigate. Like if, if I'm just looking on, like Meath, for instance, like Meath, 
And why I'm disappointed with me is because the way they sort of finished on a, on a higher note, the way they went out against Dublin last year, you'd have felt, right, they're going to kick on here. There's something there's something building you, the minors, a bit of momentum, so you're hoping with the kick on. So hopefully those players that you mentioned on again can come back, and if they could at least stave off relegation, that would be a win considering where they're at now. Yeah. And, and yeah. then they can look to the championship, right, guys, now we can build on that. But like at me, after all that, were to, to drop back down, I think, like, I think Cork, the gap's too big between Cork and Kerry for them to be realistic contenders. Yeah. You know, I think down as well, they're, they're too far up. But I, you'd like to think Meath can. Now, now look where Dublin is. Like, Jesus, Meath, how far away have they been from Dublin now? Here's an opportunity now for me. There's a pathway to a Leinster title. There's a Dublin team they can beat. You know, how much do they want to try and get their acting orders, what are we saying? Like, now, now's your time, lads. Yeah, yeah, oh. no, they're they're uh, they're just um, just treading water at the minute, and and yeah. I, I think like it's amazing, and like I remember watching the game. Meath had a chance to go level with Dublin last year. I think Roland Jones had a chance, and and he yeah. sort of you know he didn't. I think he made it easy enough for the keeper, and we know now that Dublin were very vulnerable at the time. Yeah. Um, you know, at the time we gave them the benefit of the doubt, but now they were obviously very vulnerable. So a little bit of luck and a bit more composure, and maybe they could have toppled them, but now. They're in a completely different type of battle, and beating Dublin in the championship is is uh, it's a it's a little bit high minded for where me are at the minute. I think. Okay, Dick Clark, and thanks for joining us on this week's throw in. Now it's time to review a few of the big games in the women's national football league. Former Cork footballer and captain Angela Walsh is with us. Angela, you're very welcome to the show. Let's start with Crow Park on Saturday night, the first game of that double header with the men's. So we'd finish Dublin 215, Cork 23. Angela, it wasn't a contest that we were hoping for uh, from the two teams, a dominant win for Dublin. What did Dublin have that Cork just couldn't match on Saturday night? Yeah, I mean, it was definitely a contest that we were all waiting for and it just never got going. Like Dublin had the upper hand, I think, right from the start, you know. Although Cork did kind of start well, but, you know, once they got punished for the mistakes, they definitely, Dublin just uh, cruised on then and it just never looked in doubt like a winning the game. Um, I suppose, I know Cork, like, they are missing, they were missing a few, but at the same time, I feel that they can't be waiting for the more Abbey girls to come back, you know. I, I think... Really, the girls that were playing should have kind of put up their hands a little bit more. I felt they definitely lacked movement and they lacked kind of that team performance that Dublin were oozing like and, and you know, they just never got going. It was very frustrating viewing, to be honest, and I'm sure very frustrating for them playing as well. Yeah, uh, Hannah Tyrrell got one nine eight from free. She got that goal, obviously, from the penalty. They would have been hurting, obviously, still from that All-Ireland final defeat last year. And, you know, they're, they're putting that hurt to good use, it would seem. Oh, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I know now they've only three games in the league and Mick Bowen kind of alluded to it in his interview beforehand. Just, I suppose, like they're just trying to go out and win every game, win every trophy. And uh, they're definitely hurting, I think, from last year. You know, that was a big shock. Um, and I think they will use that definitely to drive them on. As you mentioned there, Hannah Terrell, like she was phenomenal. She was like pulling the strings, like, you know, she was involved in, in every play, every score scoring one nine I mean she scored more herself than Cork combined like which was which is unbelievable and she's a massive player for Dublin like so she's really really going well as well at the moment yeah it's mad to think it was like it's just not even a year since she let you know gave up the rugby and then returned to Dublin what are you seeing different about this Dublin team under Mick Bowen after that loss last year well I suppose like um you know I just felt they were really ruthless you know like I I think Cork did kind of start well and I was saying okay this isn't too bad you know at the first couple of balls but again just the last pass that they were being overturned by Dublin um, and I think Dublin they just were ruthless like I mean you know Martina had a bad kick out they were going straight for goal like Nicole Owen scored a fantastic goal and that was as a result of a Cork mistake you know and like at that level I feel like you can't be making such mistakes like um, because Dublin uh, you know as I said they have set out their stall like their intent is clear I think you know, um, they will feel aggrieved definitely after last year's All Ireland. Like they didn't put in the performance, you know, that they're capable of against Mead last year. And uh, I'm sure, like, I mean, you know, as a team, as strong, um, and they've serious depth as well. I feel all the players that came on, they all were well able to slot in and contribute as well. So I think for them, you know, like they're just going for it this year definitely for sure. Yeah, Mick Bowen said at the start of the year, he was giving his predictions and he said that if Dublin themselves don't win the All-Iron this year, he was tipping Cork to do it. And obviously, as you mentioned there, the Moore Abbey girls um, still haven't come back. But is it concerning now, two defeats in a row for Cork? Well, look, I mean, to be fair, like, I mean, Shane Renan, he's only in, he's, you know, a new manager. 
he's trying to find his feet. Uh, you know, they are a very, very young side as well. Like a lot of those girls, like, you know, they're just really young. Like, you know, so I think they do need time. Um, I think the league this year, the fact that they have only, like, I mean, they're out of the league now with only two games under their belt. Like, that's going to be, you know, a big disadvantage to them, really, I suppose. Like, they're going to have to find kind of challenge games or good games elsewhere. Like, whereas normally in the league, you'd have six or seven games, like, and it would kind of give you, uh, you know, a good sense, like. Um, but you know what? Like, I'm not, I'm not, I, I suppose, like, you know, down and out about it or, or really concerned. Like, I still I still think there's time for Cork. And, like, you know, as I said, the likes of Kira, Darren, Breed, all the girls from Moore and do need to come back into it. But at the same time, I just feel Cork, like, they can't be relying on those girls either. You know, I felt there should have been, you know, the players that were playing on Saturday, I felt there should have been a bit more bite to, to them, you know. Like, I did feel, and Cork, like, even in the second half when they rallied, like, Sabonia, so Terry Sullivan, when she came on, she made a big impact, I felt. You know, Katie Cork kind of came, in, came into it at the end. Like, there's definitely potential. There's always potential there, you know. Um, but look, they have a lot of work to do, and there's, there's no no doubt about that. Yeah, I suppose... It's amazing, people. Sinead, how, how quickly it sort of it seems to have... Ter- like, if you go back 12 months even, you know, was, the talk was, well, it's Dublin and it's Cork, and they're a little bit cut adrift from the rest. And then sort of Mead come out of nowhere, and now Cork have lost two games in a row, and we're... You know, the dynamic of the conversation has shifted so quickly. Um but it's probably a good thing in, in in even the short term to have an extra team or a couple of other teams that are in the shake up for and and the start made have made would suggest that they're they're here to stay and to manage to keep that group together by the looks of things. So it's uh, it the conversation around ladies football has changed very quickly from being a two horse race to being a little bit more open now than than maybe people thought it was. Oh, which is only a good thing. And uh, you mentioned me there. They beat Waterford one ten to one two. That's two wins out of two now for me. And Donald, as you said, like you know, they really are showing that it was no one off what happened to them last year. Yeah, I, well, just around the county, everyone was sort of like delighted with the win. And and I think what people really responded to in Mead was was the manner of it. You know that they sort of like took it and just tried. That I covered that semi final against Cork. Like it was one of the most bizarre games I've ever been at. Like, it's sort of, it was sort of like, you know, and even even with, was it seven points at one stage? And we were sort of said, well, look, it was a very credible performance against a core team that had been around the block and to know what to do. And next thing we were doing interviews and Mead had won. Like, it, no one really understood how it happened. It was so out of the blue. And then, you know, Mead people will take a win over Dublin in anything, at any time. And the, the way they delivered that too, they just sort of overpowered them. They were really calm. They were... They galloped them into the ground. Like they made so few mistakes, and all of a sudden, made in Ireland to win. The minors won as well, and everyone was in great form for for a while. I think the important thing was, like, they, they kept the group together. A lot of talk of who would go to Australia, who wouldn't go to Australia, and like you had some very obvious candidates. Certainly, looking at it for, on the face of it, you think, oh yeah, the Aussies would be looking at them, and and they're 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 all still there. So. Um, that they hit the ground running, I think, was really important and to prove that it wasn't a flash in the pan. Because even talking to a couple of the girls that said that themselves, they were sort of like, well, you know, people think that maybe we caught them on the hop. And that's the mindset now that they, uh, they're they going to show that it wasn't a fluke. It wasn't just that Cork and Dublin were asleep at the wheel, that they're, that they're here to stay. So, um, yeah, I think me people are really really happy with how, how, their, uh, how their ladies team are going. Yeah, and Angela, like, you know, Emma Duggan scored six points from play. Vicky Wall got a goal at the weekend. I think what the exciting things about exciting thing about their marquee players is that we don't quite know what their ceiling is. Like, their potential is incredible. Yeah, oh, definitely. Like, the you know, I I, I love looking at the main team playing, actually. And uh, like that, you know, like going back to the semi-final even last year, um, as I alluded to, like, there was seven points. And again, like, it was the Cork mistakes at the end. But as well as that, it was the mead pressure. You know, like, they never gave up right till the end. Like, and that's just a fantastic sign of a team, you know. Um, I saw highlights of the the Mead and Waterford game and the conditions looked atrocious. Like, but to be fair, you know, like they kept, try, you know, really battling hard and Emma Duggan like was popping up as you as you mentioned there today. She scored six points. Like she's just, you know, I just love watching her. Like she's a fantastic player. Um, so it is very exciting and, um, you know, like it kind of does throw the championship a little bit open. Like um, I think Mead like feel that they kind of have to go out and prove like that they are a great team. They did serve to win the All-Ireland last year and, uh, you know, it wasn't just a one-hit wonder. Well, they get the chance to show that again when they play Dublin now at the start of March um, when they meet each other in Port Talton. How do you, how do you see that one going? Um, well, do you know what? Like, obviously, they're on the same side here for the, the league. Like, so um, it'll definitely be an interesting affair. But at the same time, it's a match that both of them are actually true already. 
to, to the next yeah. round of the league, you know. So, like, will the managers, because the games are so Not few sure in the, the league, hand, I, yeah. I would wonder, like, would the managers use that, like, to, to kind of just blood a few players, like, see what people are capable of, you know. I suppose, like, it's a game, as I mentioned, like, you know, they are both true. Like, obviously, whoever wins it does potentially get, like, an easier next game. But, like, is there such a thing? I don't know. Um, at the other side of it, like, when they're competitive, like Dublin and Mead, maybe they just want to keep on winning. So, like, it'll be an interesting match, actually, definitely, in two weeks' time and see what approach, I suppose, the managers take to it. Um, now, just to, before we wrap up, um, Angela, obviously, the GPA put in a motion for consideration at the GA Congress um, on Saturday, kind of urging the GA to expedite integration with the LGFA and the Camogie Association. What would you like to see happen? You know what, this is an interesting one now, um, Shane, to be honest. I, yeah, like there's definitely pros and there's cons to it. Like, you know, I suppose I would just like to see the fine print. I'd like to see the terms of it. Uh, you know, I just feel from the Ladies Gaelic Football Association, like they have just made huge strides in the last couple of years. And, you know, like, I suppose, like, from their point of view, like, are they just going to hand it all over to the G? I, I, I suppose, like, that's what I kind of want to know, like, because, you know, like, they're so progressive. Like, the ladies' football have come on so much, like, in years, you know. And, like, obviously, yeah, it's all about the players. But also, like, that association, like, they have done so much work and they are really progressive and they are, you know. I suppose, like, what I would like to see maybe is definitely more integration. But at the same time, like, you know, I think the ladies' Gaelic do need a level of autonomy themselves to be able to make their own decisions. And, you know, as I said, I'd like to see the fine print and, you know, there's definitely pros and cons, but I mean, it's it's made huge strides, like um, in terms of the last couple of years, like in terms of players, like, I mean, you know, the level of, I suppose, um, you know, coverage that they get and all the, you know, the things that go with it. I mean, like in my day, like I only retired in 2014, I didn't even get as much as a pair of boots, like, you know, or a pair of gloves or anything like that, you know. So I just feel it has come such such a long way um, you, there is more to go, like in terms of you know getting the equality. Um, but as I said, I, I suppose I'd like to see the fine print and, and kind of the overall plan uh, before making my full decision on it. John, could you think they should keep a level of autonomy, the LGFA, um, as Angela said? Well, I, I agree. I agree with Angela so far as they there's fine print to be worked out. You know, how does it? Do we get to run our own affairs? What what are playing rules, even stuff like that? You know. Who makes those decisions? Do we get to make that ourselves, or do I have to go to full Congress? You know, there there is certainly things to be ironed out there. But for me, honestly, like from from interviewing players and the stuff that comes up off a lot of the time was, you know, we 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 were uh, we were pulled out of dressing rooms, we couldn't get access to pitches, we were training on the side of a field while the men's team trained there. And you hear these stories over and over again. If you brought all the bodies under the same umbrella suddenly you would have immediate and legitimate access to all those facilities which are around the country. So it's not just the GA club, which is for the, the men and the young boys in the club, which is, which is what it is at the moment. It's not really how it's, how it's, how it's thing because most every club cooperates, I, I, in my experience anyway, with their, their ladies' wing. But you would have as much right to that pitch at Friday night at 8 o'clock as the, as the men's team or any other team. No more and no less. But at the minute, that's not the case. You're just asking for the length of a pitch in an awful lot of situations. Most places don't have their own LGFA facilities. So overnight, you would have access to 2,500 clubs that you're only sort of asking for favours to get access to now. So I, I, I agree with that the fine print has to be and may, probably some sort of autonomy. And the same with Camogie, because the playing rules are a different place to Hurling. And it's 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 evolving at the minute and the players you're talking to now that want to allow more physicality and all that so you would need LGFA people and Camogie people still running the affairs of their two associations but I think in terms of just facilities and access I think I, I, I really feel like it's a no-brainer for, for, for players and for clubs and for, for everyone really even for the GA because it just makes everything you're all together it should make everything stronger. Yeah, should that be the bottom line, Angela, that there would be equal access? Now, we don't know what the roadmap or what it would structurally look like, but do you think that should be the bottom line, that it would be equal access for male and female players? I mean, yeah, we have the one club model, obviously. Yeah, I know. Like, And that would be a huge advantage. But like, I suppose just, you know, like we'll say if the GA agree to this, like, I mean, what are they going to want for equal access? You know, that's kind of what I'm like, you know, I, I mean, look, uh, like our club here in Killa, like they're absolutely fantastic. Like anytime we ask for a pitch, anytime, like they're so accommodating. They really are. And I know like, you know, the getting thrown out of dressing rooms, like that's a real once-off. Like I think, you know, that's that doesn't happen all the time. Like it's really just 
rare, you know. Um, but like, yeah, I mean, facilities would be a huge thing because like, you know, there's nowhere really to have their own kind of proper facilities. I think there is one or two. Is there, do we have their own? Our man, our man. Oh, and Washburn have plans in for theirs as well, mm. you know. Um, like it would be a, a massive advantage, definitely. But like, I suppose like, you know, just for the ladies football to be under the whole umbrella, like, are they going to just suddenly say, well, yeah, you can come under the umbrella and now you've access to the whole thing. I just feel they're going to want more than, you know, like I, I suppose this is banded around a couple of years ago. And I remember like them saying like, well, if it is go, it does go under, like the ladies Gaelic will lose, lose their president. They're going to, you know, like there's a few different things that yeah. just need to be ironed out. Like, and I suppose get the best deal for everybody. Liam awesome. O'Neill spoke about that, Sinead, um, when he was president and he spoke about it since as well. And he said that was one of the fears of sort of like, you know, who influences who, what positions are there still there? What voting rights have we got? You know, so there is definitely stuff around that um, that, that that needs to be ironed out. And it's interesting that Angela says it there, that maybe that's the, the lesser expressed view that, hang on, there's, we're not just like everyone just looks at it and say, well, you have immediate access to all the facilities that would be the bottom line and all these things but there is it's probably a little bit more nuanced than that too to be fair no absolutely and there will be will need to be some kind of give and take on all sides for this but we wait to see um how this weekend uh, pans out angela and donica thanks for joining us thanks thank you well, that's all we've got time for on this week's Throw-In in association with Allianz. Don't forget to listen and follow the show on Apple, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. Thanks for listening. It's only 30 years of Allianz supporting the leagues and we're not done yet. Only the leagues, only the Allianz leagues.